Dykes, we were talking about we're fingers, not yeah. girls. I guess we're going. <laughs> I guess you're going. You ready? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Why wouldn't I be ready? <laughs> Sisters, welcome to Penn Sunday School, starring Penn Gillette. My name is Michael Goudeau. Matt Donnelly, Penn and I are broadcasting from Show Creator Studios South in Las Vegas. On today's show, we're talking with Gary Marcus. He's a scientist, author, entrepreneur, and professor at NYU. We'll continue talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and maybe we'll get into innateism. Here he is, preaching love, Mr. Penn Gillette. Uh, yeah, rebooting AI, building artificial intelligence we can trust by Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. Uh, I read the book, learned a wicked lot, and we're just talking to try to learn even more, trying to pick Gary Marcus's brain. Seems like brain. in episode one, if I were to interpret an editorial slant uh, from our guests, it'd be that it, we shouldn't put so much faith in AI as we're putting as we move forward. You sum that up and a computer could not have. <laughs> and Touché. I also just want to say that you're also... Penn learned a lot at Sunday school. Taking uh, apocalyptic thinkers to task as well. And that, that's an optimistic approach to what you're doing as well, which a lot of people always just think every time an AI article right. comes out, you go, that's it. Singularity, we're going down. Singularity, Everybody run. <laughs> Terminator, we're done. We have a lot of risks. Robots are going to destroy us. About that in the book. One, one is some advice in case the robots come and attack. We're pretty sure that they won't because they're too stupid and they don't care. But we say if the robots should attack, number one, Close the door. If that doesn't work, <laughs> lock the door. <laughs> I bet you could probably paint stripes on the door, and that would be enough that they wouldn't find you, right? And if, if that doesn't work, put up a big fan, because they're not very good at friction and wind, and they'll probably <laughs> fall over. Put some jacks on the floor, or maybe some bananas, they'll slip. And if that doesn't work, just talk to them in a foreign accent in a noisy room, and they'll never understand. <laughs> He, he has solved the, the doomsday robot. guide. You should just write it out and start selling it. <laughs> now, what about um, uh, and this this the, once again like the uh, like the like the 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 Google Deep Thought Dreams Deep Dream. What do they call that again? Deep Dream. Deep Dreams. There's a whole bunch of math, but that's the main one. Yeah, like like that one. Um, there's a the stories of getting robots to play video games and them finding ways to play video games that no human had thought of. There's also the story about chess, which um, I can't remember where I read it or if I made it up, which is what we do on Sunday school all the time, try to guess whether I <laughs> read it or made it up because I never know. Um, uh, aren't chess, uh, serious AI chess uh, programs, Aren't they now playing in ways that humans never did? Or is that apocryphal? I think it's true. I mean, how true, I don't know. They've, they've come up with at least some moves in standard openings that humans wouldn't do. Um, and that's both true in chess and Go. I have a friend- And also like sacrificing the queen at a They, they may time. do that in a place where a person wouldn't. My friend Grady Booch had a great tweet about this. That's, that's a great name. It is. A, Grady Booch has a great name. <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, he works at IBM. And, and his line was- these people want to interpret this as creativity and it really just means that the machines were more thorough in searching a space of possibilities than people were and they stumbled on some spots that hadn't been explored Which, it, but isn't that another what you just described uh, another definition of creativity it could be i i think in the particular case it's ascribing a lot to the machine that maybe isn't really fair so you know when a musician thinks about what if i would apply this kind of you know poetry and, and turn this into song and nobody's ever done that before at some level you could say the same thing and at some level you could say they're putting whole whole different techniques together in ways that haven't been before whereas the machine is just doing the same thing over and over and over again it's doing monte carlo tree search it's like if i go there and you go there with some probabilities um to recognizing particular patterns and it's just very thorough in doing that and it doesn't have the romance let's say of creativity but there is an argument ultimately that creativity is just like i'm taking one of these and one of those and and you know it looks cool when i do it so it's well, arguable they, they have had uh the uh the the computer generated uh box style pieces sure it is. Been, i mean that goes back like 30 years yeah that have been put in into box programs sure. where people uh, people could not tell I mean, one of the things we have to be, I think we have to be careful of is that the romance that we put onto AI 
like the really understanding, uh, has to be tempered with the romance we put on to human thinking, which isn't really there. I think that's right. I, I mean, I think uh, was it the 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 Mark Mark Shaney was it called? Yeah. The um the uh, the program that took you know Mark V Shaney. Right? Yeah, it was a thing that uh, they did out of uh, Bell Labs that was on the web. It was just doing this really simple thing where it would take the first three words and decide what the most likely next word was. Mm -hmm. uh, well, GP2, two, GP2. Synthetic two Usenet user who's posting is, in yeah. net singles news groups were generated by the Markov chain techniques. So there's a better version of that now that OpenAI put out called GPT2, um, which has huge samples of Reddit, but it's really the same idea. And it makes text that um, I like to call fake spear. So it, like, it'll sound like Shakespeare if you feed in Shakespeare or whatever, um, but it won't be as coherent. So mm -hmm. you can put in a few sentences into GPT-2, like the first three sentences of today's show. Um, you could do this in your show notes and to talk to transformer.com. And it'll create a bunch of stuff that kind of looks like human language, but it won't be as coherent as our interview. We could make our interview even more coherent if we edit it. Um, but there's a kind of coherence of human conversation where we're talking about the same topics, we come back to them, we refer to what we were talking about before, we build on things in a cumulative way. Machines can't really do that. What they can do is to capture the statistics of this word follows this word and this other one follows that word. So they can make um, can now make pretty good text that sounds grammatical, but it's still pretty poor. So if you're doing Shakespeare- Like those, those like um, the big articles on the Olive Garden commercial. Or the Batman comic. Have you seen those? I have not this seen those. This is AI generated a Olive Garden commercial, and it's amazing. So now you could do for essentially anything. The technique is really impressive. Um, and the first few sentences would seem okay. And then if you really read it and paid attention, you'd be like, but there's no story there. Um, yeah. So in this El Manzo thing I mentioned briefly at the end of our, our last episode, um, um, there's a children's story. A boy finds a wallet. Um, returns it to its rightful owner. The, the owner counts the money. I fed that story into GPT-2. Mm -hmm. And when the owner finds the money, he's really happy. You feed it into GPT-2 and it continues. Then he went back to a safe place and looked for his money. And if you read that and you're paying attention, you realize the system doesn't understand that the guy's got his money in the wallet. And it's just riffing off, so to speak, um, the notion that wallets are safe places. And so it knows the statistics of words, wallets, and safe places, but it doesn't know why you would put your money in a wallet or why you would go look for money in a safe place. And you wouldn't if you've got the money there with you. You, 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 you keep, um, we keep banging up against this, this understand thing. I think it's the central thing. Yeah. It's the difference between just accumulating a lot of statistics and building a model of the world that you can act on. So there's a, So you there's, think the understanding is is the model and that when we understand something we just um keep uh, understanding the model that's not me I don't think. Keep the model uh keep the model more. We just we just we can expand build on our the model. model. So like I mentioned that you like the word counterfactual. I do. If you have a model of the world then you can say, what if something about this model were different? You can be act on it. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the difference between causation and correlation. So mm -hmm. if you just have- You're not seeing our show tonight, are you? <laughs> I think I can't actually, but I've seen it before. Yeah. I saw it recently nope. in, in- But you didn't see- uh, Ben has a whole routine. I have a, I have a routine called correlation causation. Oh my gosh, you're going to make me regret my um, my, uh, my play and, arrangements. And it is, it is, a, uh, it is a bit that, uh, we get a lot, of, I mean, not, there's nothing in our show here that you saw. It's all, it's all different stuff. But I have a bit called, my heart. called Correlation Sticks that is just about David Hume it, doing magic. It's a shame because you are the ideal audience for this trick and that's not a wide <laughs> audience. Shut up! <laughs> it's still in the show even though one person a night likes it. All one, Shut up! Uh, all one of Could you have had really two tonight. To see a video Could have had two. Face. Could have had two tonight. There'll be one tonight. But go on. <laughs> so, so I mean, if you can talk David Hume, then you know what this is all about, right? I mean, D David Hume was like, you know, stuff happens, some other stuff happens. Mm -hmm. But the way that we humans perceive the world is one thing causes another, as opposed to one thing doesn't cause another. Um, and we interpret the world differently. You gave the, the joke before about Bono causing people to die by clapping the hands. We realize that that's actually ridiculous. Um, but a deep learning system doesn't. A deep learning system sees, you know, clock tick person dying, clock tick Bono clapping hands and thinks they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
the key lesson of the book is is really that deep learning, this particular technique, is not about deep understanding. If we want to take AI to the next level, as opposed to the level that just runs trains, um, it's going to have to have understanding. It's going to have to know which things cause which other things and why. One one example we like is um, if I show you a picture of a cheese grater, um, you can build a, a AI system, or well, not an AI system, but a computer science system that can represent that grader so that you could drive through it in Grand Theft Auto with very tiny cars or something like that, or you can make a really big grader. So you build the shape in, but we don't have any kind of system that could look at a grader and say, why is there a handle on top? Or why are these circles asymmetrical and part of them sharp? And what we do when we see something like a grader or a guitar or a bottle or anything is we're like, what is this for? Or we, we do that with an animal. Like, why does it have sharp teeth? We're always asking these why questions. We're always looking for answers that are about causality. This thing causes this other thing. And that's core to how we get around the world. And it's core to how we deal with the counterfactuals is we're like, well, I know that you know this mug would allow me to pour things, but if I took the handle away, it would, it would work differently. I might burn my hand. Is, is that why we like will have tackling driving first? Because that seems like a system that we think operates best by rules and not a lot of whys. Um, driving is actually an interesting case because there's a continuum from something like chess or go where the rules haven't changed in 2,500 years right. and the range of options is really restricted. And so that fits with what AI can do now and real life, which is at the opposite extreme where you can do anything at any moment. So I'm here in, sitting in the studio. I could keep talking to you, but I could get up and go to the bathroom or if there were a fire, I could run out the door or I could knock the table. You know, there's an infinite range of things that I could do at any moment. And there's some rules, but there's also a lot of gray area that like, you know, socially it would be a bit awkward for me to leave right now. You'd think I was weird. Maybe you wouldn't air the show, but I could do it. There's all this kind of ambiguity. Driving's in between. Oh, we'd air it. <laughs> you'd air it. Uh, <laughs> I should have known that about you. But, yeah, yeah. but driving is in between. So there's a relatively limited set of rules. You can get the California driver's handbook or whatever. Um, but then there's all this kind of gray area of Sure, there are times when you pull up to an intersection or where things have been, there's construction or there's dirt and you- Exactly. Takes and you a moment of, well, where can I go? And it's not in the rule book and you no. might not have seen it before right. or something's you know drifting in the wind and you got to figure out. Like there was an article by um, uh, Stephen Levy a couple of years ago about driverless cars at Waymo. And the big dramatic finish was that they had learned to recognize in this whole artificial city that they had built, learn to recognize leaves so they wouldn't stop every day right. time sure, of they ran into a patch of leaves. So every one of those cases, going back to band-aids we've been talking about, um, every one of those requires a different band-aid because there's no underlying conception of like there's stuff in the world and it might move around and some of it's heavy and some of it's not. And so if you just try to do it with specific rules, that's too specific. And if you just try to do it with the data that you have, it's too narrow. So driving actually should be relatively easy for AI. Um, it should be a lot easier than doing the Rosie the Robot thing or doing a generalized rescue system in circumstances that are going to be unusual. But even that turns out to be pretty hard. Right. Uh, but I'm even getting back to like your under the word understanding and, and questioning why and causality. So when you're talking about like rebooting AI, we is that the essential thing you're trying to tackle? And are there examples where we have tackled it? I mean, the book is, is you know, optimistic in the end because we think if we tackled the right problems, it'd be great. But a lot of the point in the book is that the field has been ducking the hard problems. So there's a term of the literature called a local minimum. Like imagine you're trying to climb down a mountain and you keep going down, always taking small steps going down, which should remind you of evolution a little bit. You can get stuck in a place where there's nothing anywhere near you that's lower, but it's not really that good. Um, you're trying to minimize mm -hmm. error in, in the computer science term. I think the field is stuck in a local minimum. It's making better and better this deep learning stuff by getting more and more data and finding more and more tricks to use that data. But it's not getting at these hard questions like how do you represent what a cheese grater is to a computer, right? We need to be able to teach computers to reason about things like graters or bottles or tables or all, all the stuff but how, in the world. But how do we you know, gain the information to do that? Well, is, I think is we it that we're just... I mean, uh, as the uh, self-driving cars are out there, aren't they learning more every day on their own? And won't they eventually catch up on their own? Or do we really need to push them? Because I don't think we, as kids, we weren't pushed well, to figure out what a cheese grater was. 
No, but here, here's how I think we were pushed. It's by evolution. Yeah. Evolution pushed us to have what I would call a strong starting point, or, you know, I'll call it innate um, starting right. points. Not everybody likes the term, and there's a lot of resistance to anything being built sure. in the mind and so forth. But if you look, let's say, at a baby ibex climbing down a mountain, that baby ibex, within hours of its birth, can um, yeah, it clamber came down with the some programming. Clearly, it came, came with, with some programming. programming. Absolutely, programming for recognizing three dimensional shape, right. for recognizing how its own body relates to that three dimensional shape, and then it learns some stuff. It calibrates its own body right. size. What I think humans do, anyway, and a lot of biological creatures, is they have strong starting points. There's a bunch of pre-programming, but it's like a rough draft. It all gets overwritten eventually, but that rough draft really scaffolds what you learn, right. and there is a resistance right now in the field called machine learning, which is dominating AI right now, to having any of that scaffolding there. There's one little thing everybody builds in. But besides that, they don't want to build in, for example, just the basic notions like there are objects in the world. Those objects continue to exist in right. space and time. They move on connected paths in space and time. They don't just wink in and out of existence. Um, that there are locations, that there are sets, that there are psychological beings like people and dogs and so forth. And then once you start with that, you can assimilate the knowledge around you to have a rich understanding of the world. So you, you don't start obviously with the notion of a cheese grater, but you might start with the notion that there are objects and that objects have function. And that would be really helpful. And, and if all you're doing is labeling pictures, this is a greater, you don't have that notion of function there. So we push very hard in the book to have people work on the problem of teaching computers to understand function in some kind of machine interpretable way. It's like we know how to translate a picture into binary code now. Right. We know how to translate words into binary code but we don't know how to translate yet things like function and that's a hard problem and people are avoiding it to work on the easy problems are there no examples of technology accomplishing this that particular thing there's no general so um i mean you could think for example of gps navigation system knows that a vehicle can, has the possibility to follow pathways and it knows something about shortest path. Right. That's a narrow case that maybe comes a little bit close, but like there's no domestic robot that understands the objects in an ordinary home and what they can do, which ones are dangerous, which ones might be lifted safely. There really is no current technology for that. Is there, sorry, is there, is there anyone tackling this that you know of? Yeah, my company. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So, so Ro Rodney Brooks, who um, would a robot know that he walked into a trap <laughs> like I just did? <laughs> okay, this is Pam. I'm going to do an ad for uh, Quip. Uh, talk about toothbrushing, right? I'm in a hotel in uh, Florida, and I got to tell you, uh, uh, brushing your teeth is wicked important. It's like the big thing. And what do you think is most important in a toothbrush? You think it's power? No. You think it's miraculous, trendy claims? No. You think it's all this uh, 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 multiple modes? No. Can't just say none of that. It's how you use it. And that's why Quip is so great because it's really smart, easy to use, and cheap, 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 cheap. Quip sensitive vibrations with built in timer. Gently guide brushing for dentist recommended two minutes with 30 second pulses, ensuring an even clean. Quip automatically delivers brush heads to you every three months for clean new bristles right on the schedule. The sleek, intuitive design is simple to use. It comes with a travel cap that doubles as a mirror mount. These thoughtful features make brushing something you actually want to do twice a day. Good habits matter to live a healthier life, so help form fresh oral habits with. Quip. Quip starts at 25 bucks and you get your first refill free at getquip.com slash pen. Simple way to support our show and start brushing better. All you have to do is go to getquip.com slash pen, P-E-N-N. -N. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash pen. Right now, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash pen. <laughs> you were you were being generous. So so Rodney Brooks, who co-founded Roomba or yeah. iRobot that makes Roomba, and I started a company about four or five months ago. And the goal of this company really is to build a new set of tools so that robots have situational awareness and know what's going on. They can predict the consequences of their actions. They can work in open-ended environments and so forth. But we really have to build what we want from scratch. It just doesn't exist. There are a lot of tools we can rely on. We can use deep learning, for example, because our systems need to be able to recognize those objects and we can use deep learning to do the recognition. But the part that's about reasoning about what those objects do and what they 
you know, what they might do later and so forth. Nobody's worked on this problem lately. They worked on it in the 60s. Um, there's a great line from Star Trek, The City on Their Edge of Forever, the episode by Harlan Ellison, mm -hmm. where, where Spock, I think, is trying to make a communicator. And he says, look, I can't do it with stone, or don't rush me. I, all I have is stone knives and bearskins. We, we're sort of at the stone knives and bearskins um, level of AI for dealing with how things work in the world. And you, you, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, um, uh, is there a, <laughs> is there a way when a computer looks at a picture the computer is looking at numbers yeah. and comparing these numbers to other numbers to see the and things all computers ever it's do it's never also. seeing the pictures it's mm -hmm. never seeing the pictures it's what drives me crazy because even when they show those deep dreams they're just showing number patterns that we've chosen to interpret that way if you had a cheese grater mm -hmm. and you uh had the computer run through every possible thing that could do mm -hmm. and uh when it finally hit this can take objects of this and and uh and slice it up grate it uh and you had to do that with a billion things and of this billion things it does these 20 He's 35 out of a billion. Um, and you did that with many, many objects. Could you get an understanding of why that was just a series of numbers, just like the picture recognition is, without any sort of causation? Well, I'll flip it around a little bit and say that whatever the right answer is to us, at some level, it will just look like a bunch of numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but you can think of logic. So logic is just a bunch of rules to take a bunch of letters or numbers and manipulate them, but such that if you apply true sets of operations, you get true conclusions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what allows us to have calculators and it's what allows us to have computer programs. Um, the whole tradition of computer programming is you have a well-defined set of rules well-defined basically variables and operations over variables, just like in algebra. I can add these things, I can compare them, I can store them in different places. And that's how we build computer programs. And the computer programs are just binary sets of numbers, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and they do incredibly powerful things, like they drive our web browsers or um, our word processors um, or the um, you know audio software that you'll use to edit this um, conversation and so forth. Um, and the right set of code here I think will at least look partly like that. And a way to think about it is that the deep learning tradition is a very different tradition. It's very popular now. It's a very successful a particular set of problems, which is labeling objects. Um, and it does things in a different way. It does things by saying these numbers and this label are correlated. Mm -hmm. These numbers and this other label are correlated. Or these numbers and these numbers are correlated. And maybe labels. this set of numbers is in between those two that also had this label. That's how it works. But it doesn't do the stuff that traditional computer programming does or that Marvin Minsky's right. students right. work exactly. on. Right, exactly. And what I'm saying, actually, is we need a marriage of those two. Mm -hmm. So there are problems for which doing the interpolation between numbers to get the labels is just the right thing to do. And there are problems where it actually needs to look like a computer program. We need to get better at writing those computer programs automatically. The kind of computer programs that look like algebra and allow us to represent abstract ideas. Well, there's a thing that's happening. Um, uh, what, what, what I found really fascinating about your book and other stuff is not so much, I mean, yes, everything, everything that is correct. But, um, I got really interested in a way that I hadn't been before of, um, of what comes the other way. And I tried to talk about this when we looked at deep dreams and saying, here's another way to look at a cat. You know, I mean, uh, I think we're getting to, uh, ways to look at a blackbird. There's another way to look at a cat that the computer has taught us. And now I look at the way the computer sees a cat. And at some level, because I'm learning as well, I learn something different about what a, how a cat is defined. And uh, when we have the computer play the press, the, the chess program, where it does an opening gambit that we haven't thought of before, we then know that opening mm -hmm. gambit. And, uh, what I'm finding interesting is all of your talk about how we teach computers to be more like us 
is fascinating and important, and that's where all the technology lies. But in terms of uh, 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 of art and emotion and growing ourselves, the other direction really fascinates me. And there's VR we always talk about, but then we went to AR, you know, mm-hmm. augmented reality. And what really interests me is, is you know, there's the, the playing video games and there was that game with the boat where the uh, computer just spun the boat to get extra, extra points. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, just playing outside outside the rules, or outside our intuition, our emotion. I'm really fascinated by uh, being able to get the connections. I mean, once you even said that a school bus on its side looks like a snowplow, uh, or uh, or that the silhouette of an elephant uh, heavily backlit looks like a person, what you were making is poetic um comparisons that weren't made by a human i think you're being charitable but you could be that charitable if you want (laughs) yeah i want to be that charitable because i do think that when you learn from the chessboard that there's another gambit and we can learn that there's another way to um enrich our view of what to use the only example there is a cat is in uh in that, like when I'm finding my, uh, when I'm using my photos program and it's, it's tagging and it, uh, it, uh, mislabels. Whenever it mislabels, there's a beautiful moment where I spend just a second, maybe, and that may be longer than it really is, um, thinking, why did the computer think this was my daughter? You know, this is one of the dancers that was topless on bullshit (laughs) and they think it's my daughter and what parts of their face, which I don't see, does the computer see as that? And I, I haven't read anything, you know, that that's trickled down to the, uh, to the lay press that deals with stuff going in that direction. I, I long for, and it may be out there. I long for the article by the chess player. Who goes? I watched, you know, Deep Blue and did it da, 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 play chess, and this is the way I play now. Well, the first thing I'll say is that in chess, I think there are real discoveries, so to mm-hmm. speak, that the machine made. You can argue about whether it's creative or not, but there are gambits there. That the I don't chess, care, we're not talking about creative at all. We're just talking yeah, about did it, we learn something? We learned something there, and um, I actually had an interesting Twitter discussion with um, Magnus Carlson's coach i'm sorry i can't remember his name right now um about this and you know he can point to real examples where the boundaries of chess knowledge expanded based on the new system so so if a person was playing chess in uh in uh 21st century as opposed to playing chess in the 19th century there are new moves now there are moves well how about say there are new moves there are new moves that a person would play that are that were discovered by computers and not by people. I think that's right. And I would distinguish between AlphaGo, which came on those discoveries by doing systematic search, and the deep learning system that says that the school bus is a snowplow. Okay, we'll talk about so the, the difference. So doing systematic search, having machine aid you in that search, I think is a legitimate way of expanding the frontiers of human knowledge. The other one, it's just like the computer screwed up because it's it's zeroing in on the wrong things. And I don't think there's anything that deep to learn. Oh, yeah, I see, I see. You know, so, so some of these things, we're building new machines that really do something interesting. And some, they're just bad. And we're trying to like apologize for the badness of the yeah, machine. But, but you, you know, uh, William Burroughs, writing something or uh, take a uh, slightly newer example, you know, David Byrne or something that are, they're taking uh, hunks of language Mm -hmm. that happen to fit into the meter that they want to use. And Mm -hmm. some of your heavily constrained poets who do Mm -hmm. heavily constrained poetry, um, they pick, they pick up this stuff. And uh, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a technique that, that some people use that I find fascinating, which is when they're, they have a real, problem they try to work it out in rhyme Mm -hmm. because by constraining the language they learn something Mm -hmm. and if we just cut up those pieces of paper and throw them in and then pull them out and look at a poem laid out like that uh, our mind tries desperately to put those together and does and can do very beautiful things um 
any one of those beautiful things you could also get just randomly. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. You know? I'm, I'm starting with just random. Now, if we add to just random uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of deep learning, that's finding other connections. So, uh, if we've got um, here's another way of looking at a cat that I get from deep learning, uh, and then we have. 50 pictures of cats that are cut up and handed to me. I learned something from both of those things. But um, is it possible that there is a kind of um, learning that if we were computers talking, humans couldn't understand? A kind of um, uh, smoothness and averaging of a billion images that you can't do because you haven't looked at a billion For sure. I, I think that they do do that. Um, I think that they do it in a way that's not terribly principled. And then we as humans can make something of some of those cases and not others. And, um, you know, so sometimes we're being a bit charitable to the machines well, you, you, to you, think that there's like an intention behind it. But, there but we don't have but to be, we don't have to be charitable. I mean, if you, you just you, want to use it as, as a technique, I think it's fine. Yeah. I think I, 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 what I'm, what I'm getting at is if you have, if you feed all of Bach into a computer program and the computer program takes that and uh, in ways we don't completely understand, right. just sloppification. Uh, a a Bachishness yeah, to it. <laughs> spits out another Bach thing. And then just like the chess player, a musician takes that and says, uh, this averaging that the computer did actually leads me to an idea from the averaging. What I'm saying is there's an, there's an augmentation yeah. of taking this thing that computers do well and this thing people do well and just forcing them together. And what I'm saying, I guess, is that there's, I don't know if it's a continuum is the right word, but there are cases like chess where the machine is doing something systematic and where you can really quantify that that thing that it's found is better than um, historical human practice. Mm -hmm. There are domains like music where that hasn't really happened yet, but could. Mm -hmm. And there are domains like writing a screenplay where it's not going to happen anytime soon, because in order to have a coherent screenplay, you need to understand the causal relationships between the characters, the motivations, the actions that they take. And so or forth. picking up bottles after a party, it's possible that the computer, when it does solve this problem, might solve it in a way that humans wouldn't. That is possible. Um, you know, right now they're not well equipped to do that, but there are lots of examples in the AI literature where the, um, human tries to specify goals for a machine, doesn't fully specify the rules and the machine bends the rules it paper doesn't clips. know about. So, well, the paperclip is a different case. We can come to that in a second, but, um, there are cases like you tell a soccer playing robot, you need to score as many points as possible, um, by keeping the opponent from getting the ball and it just falls on the ball. Mm-hmm. And like a human would say that's not allowed and they would actually rewrite the rules of robot soccer right. to uh, prohibit it. But if you don't spell out exactly all the rules in your head, then the machine might find a shortcut that we think is <coughs> illegitimate, but it's legitimate within the set of rules that it's been given. And that happens all the time. Um, OpenAI had some cute examples of this earlier in the week, and th this has been going on for years and years. We have a, a summary of them, I think on page 37 of the book. Um, I don't know the whole book, but I happen to know that page. <laughs> um, it, uh, I think her name is Victoria Krakonova, has this great list that, that um, came up last week mm -hmm. um, in reference to OpenAI. So machines do that all the time. But the, the chess cases are systematic. The cases in a screenplay don't exist because the system doesn't understand it. And then there are intermediary cases where like you could use the deep dream stuff. The deep dream stuff itself isn't kind of all that deep conceptually, but you could look at, you know, 10 different outputs and be like, these seven are really great. You know, I have a friend who does deep le learning art and, you know, he does a certain amount of human curating of the mm -hmm. cases. And well, certainly you can do that. Is the word that happens there. I mean, that's, that's right. Whereas in chess, it's not. I mean, no. that's what's interesting about the chess case. You don't need the human in the loop. You just need an algorithm that says, compare this to historical practice. I don't know if it's been done this way, but you could do this. Compare this with historical practice and see which one gives a better result. And you can just have the machine churn away and report each move that seems to be better than the um, historical thing. You couldn't do that for a screenplay. We don't have the way of evaluating what's a good screenplay, and we don't have the um, AI system that's capable of building a good screenplay, whereas chess is a very bounded domain and we can do that now.
Well, part of uh, my friend uh, Perry is very fond of saying uh, artificial intelligence is much easier than artificial stupidity. Well, and then there's the old AI versus natural stupidity. Yeah. Right. Because cause it's, it's that random chaos stuff that really does does help so often in creativity. I, I Because I said the word paperclip, you've got to now explain that so you don't leave people there's off. A, there's a famous example Nick Bostrom mm -hmm. uh, made about what if there was an AI system, and this also on this point about goals, what if an AI system was programmed to make paperclips? And that's all it did, and that was its so-called reward function. And first it used up all the metal that it could find on the planet Earth. Um, and then it went to other planets and then it kind of ran out of mining to do. And then it started basically mining people for trace amounts of metal to make more paper clips because that's what it's reward was. And then couldn't we all turn into paper clips? So a lot of bright people are terrified by this scenario. Mm -hmm. And we are not. Ernie and I think it's ridiculous for a number of Because of the demand of paper clips? Like, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that, that is actually need. one of the things we there's point a, out. There's a store called Staples. There is not a store called paper clips. <laughs> that's your argument. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember if we put this in the final version or not, but we did actually point out if a system is so intelligent that it can figure out that there's the metal in the people and figure out how to persuade the people to go into the you know factories in order to allow themselves to be free paper pizza. Clips. That's right. It has enough free <laughs> yeah. pizza signs. Wasn't hard and all that. <laughs> that system could probably actually do the computation of like who's going to buy these paper clips? Is this economically efficient? And maybe decide that this was not a good idea after You've all. So you have you have to suspend dil uh, disbelief in many directions, and one of them is on the economics of it. Another is on assuming that a system could have enough common sense to be able to go after the people, realize that the free pizza will get them in into the store that will you know lead to them being melted down and so forth. So you have to have intuitive psychology, intuitive phys or physical reasoning, psychological reasoning in order to make all this work. And if you could do all of that, then it would be really easy to program at that point Asimov's laws in. And as long as you programmed in Asimov's laws, made it legally a requirement, which it should be, um, that you have that in your software, then this would just never happen. So you, you have to have like, 17 different improbable things um, and a lot of people with really no sense at all building the machines before that actually happens. And you also have to have machines that like have some kind of like malice or something like that for the whole Terminator scenario. And we've never seen any of that. So all, all of this stuff to us seems like nonsense, assuming that you build machines that have the kind of common sense that we think is prerequisite to going forward. Now, um, it's always fun to argue with people who aren't here. Uh, but <laughs> Kurzweil's idea of uh, singularity yeah. and so on, and we're going to get somewhere quickly, doesn't even cross your mind that that's a uh, possibility. Well, we discuss it, and what we say is that um, many things are exponential. That's his big term for mm -hmm. things moving very fast, like chess, like Go. You can actually document it. And other things, there's been almost no progress in 60 years. So the ability to have a machine understand a conversation you know, we didn't have it in 1965 when we had Eliza that pretended by noticing keywords. And now what do we have 60 years later? We have Google pretending with keywords and it doesn't really understand. Mm -hmm. so there's no progress on understanding conversations. In 1965, we had the dream of Rosie the robot that would tidy our houses. And now we have nothing. We just have Roomba that, that can clean the stuff that's on the floor. And so on that, there's been no progress in 60 years. So what, what Kurzweil does not do is to look at both sides of the argument. This is a cognitive error. I know you're into cognitive errors. Mm -hmm. So there's a cognitive error called motivated reasoning where you look, and also confirmation bias, two closely yeah. related things. So you notice evidence that supports your theory. He notices all the uh, exponentials, but he never talks about the things that aren't exponential. Mm -hmm. And then he likes to say, and look how smart I am. My predictions are all right. Um, motivated reasoning is mostly about ego and you know protecting your ego and saying my approach is right. But if you actually look at the data on general intelligence, which is what he's really talking about there has not been exponential progress there's been no argument that there's been exponential progress except for from these narrow things like chess which don't count as general intelligence so i'm not going to become gray goo soon you're not going to become gray goo anytime soon. i gotta start trying harder as a dad then <laughs> i'd really given up well, yeah. and, i mean a lot of people are worried about machines. my kids are going to grow up that's drag <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of they'd be ruined by then a lot of people are worried about AI taking all our jobs, and it may in some longer truck term driver. scale. Truck, truck drivers maybe should be the most worried. Taxi drivers and Uber drivers don't need to be worried that much. And anybody whose job involves reading for right now, you know, AI can't actually read right so now. Wait, sorry, you have you have a company that you sold to Uber or the That's company right. that you currently work no, for? No, so I've had two companies. The first one I built, 
2014, sold to Uber in 2016, and the second one I built a few months ago and is currently operational. So isn't Uber isn't Uber banking on the concept that you've been tearing apart for these podcasts? Um, I think Uber's view- They don't listen to this show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, let me preface this by saying that every single person that was above me at Uber that I worked with is yeah. gone now. The okay. people that I worked with um, at Uber were of the view, and I think said this publicly, that driverless cars pose an existential threat to Uber. So if Waymo were the first place to have driverless cars actually work, yeah, then they could do what Uber did and pay no labor charges. Right. And that would undercut Uber. And so it's not that Uber thought the driverless cars were necessarily coming next week. It's that they thought if they come next week, we better be there. Okay. Um, and so I don't think that they were necessarily delusional about how hard the problem was. I mean, different different people had different views. I agreed with some of those people and not others. Um, but overall, the view was not necessarily that it was a short-term problem, but rather that it was one that had to be on their radar in a pretty serious way. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean- Those singularities coming quick for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we always go to Doug Stanhope, who, who said, I think, brilliantly, isn't our goal 100% unemployment? Well, at, at Google, somebody, I, maybe I won't mention names, but he said everybody at Google's job is to replace themselves, to build a bit of software that they do, um, that does their job automatically for them. Right. And I mean, the long term of AI is we're going to automate a lot of things. The, the short term, as I've been arguing, is it's not really nearly as good as we think it is now. But I, I wrote this line in New Yorker once about Kurzweil, actually. I said, look, I, I disagree with him a, a lot, but it's really a matter of like 20 years versus 100. Um, or I think I said 20 versus 50. 100 years from now, nobody's really going to care how long it took. They're going to care what happened next after the point at which AI was good enough to do most jobs. And so, you know, did we move to a society with universal basic income? And if we did, did we move there in a kind of gradual way or was it sudden and overnight where the riots did a lot of people die um my view is we w we will have to move to a society with universal basic income at some point because at some point most jobs will be done by yeah and is, is is everybody going to be in show business well yes well i'm but i mean <laughs> show business will remain a, a viable occupation um, and just the way we still have Thank people you, Jesus. running, oh, <laughs> even ever. You know, we, we have people running in the Olympics, even though horses run faster than people and cars yeah. run faster than horses. So show oh, well, one person me. ran faster than a horse. They had that <laughs> <laughs> took 30 taken, years of but, trying. Um, well, but with medicine, we'll get to the point where all of us will run faster than Olympic athletes and Olympic athletes will be the only ones not allowed to take the drugs. And so, you, <laughs> so you'll go, he's pretty quick. I mean, I'm faster for, than him. Pretty quick for, a, he's pretty for quick an old for fashioned. Human. For, for, <laughs> for, a human. Exactly. for a pure I human, I can outrun him, but you know. But you know, uh, I feel sorry for him. But I think I just want to uh, and uh, the 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 only two things that bothered me about your book, and there are two things you're very aware, very aware of, and are probably in the book. And I was just you know wasn't paying close enough attention there. Is that um, just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it's not great. Uh, and you have to compare it to what it's replacing. My argument, if you know, if we get 39,000 deaths instead of 40, we've made a big improvement. If nuclear power is a little better than coal power, we've made, we've made a big improvement. But I don't disagree with no, that. No, no, you don't. That's what right. I'm saying. I mean, the, the disagreement there is not that we think it's not worth building systems that it would cut the mortality rate no. by 5%. We were all for that. Um, we just don't think that the technology actually allows that yet. But uh, but going back to what you first said, uh, people who fall asleep while driving, well, you, I, I, I'm not ignoring your argument. Your argument is you're more likely to fall asleep when a Tesla's driving than you are with a regular car. Well, there is that separate but, problem. But those two things being equal, you are better off dozing off for a second while the Tesla is driving than dozing off for a second when the Tesla is not driving. Right. I mean, Larry Page made the um, decision to move from so-called level four driverless cars to level five. So level four is basically like cruise control. It's helping you, mm -hmm. but you're still in charge. And level five is the machine does the entire process. Yeah. And his view based on work that they had done at Waymo um, or the, it might not have been called Waymo at that time, but Google's division was that 
level four was never going to work because people were going to stop paying attention. So it's a human cognitive yeah. flaw right. that if something works most of the time, we trust it. I call that, again, the gullibility gap. Mm -hmm. um, you call it whatever you like. There's a psychological literature on vigilance tasks. If you need to do something like all the time and need to pay attention, you just won't. You get bored. It's it's, it's the uh, Sawmill River Parkway, right? The Sawmill River Parkway was designed to be safer because it was harder to drive. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so his, his view, traffic circles. His view uh, yeah. was was that traffic. We should only have traffic circles. Stoplights are insane. Right. But that's a battle that may have been lost. So <laughs> long, monotonous highways are, are terrible for people. Yeah. But also, a driverless car that worked ninety nine point nine percent of the time, but required you to pay attention, would be a disaster. Yes. Yeah. That's, that, that's what he decided, and I, I think that he's right. Um, I think there is room for things like cruise control and intelligent lane monitoring and so forth. I do. Uh, but there's a there's a valley of death there too, where the systems mm -hmm. get really good, but they're not perfect. That's what happened with a guy who's watching Harry Potter. And I can feel that in my Tesla. You know, I drive home after work the same route, and I try very hard to make sure that I still control speed and lane change so that, and I've also had, and I very much have had, not falling asleep, but I very much have had uh, the uh, the Tesla help me. Mm -hmm. the Tesla, the, what it What it says it does legally it's actually done for me a lot, you know, not, not right. the, it, that, not the off label use, and but the real use. Larry's view, which I think is right is, um, I'll put it in my own words, um, is if the Tesla helps you enough times, you tend to trust it too much. Right. Um, and the right thing to do is what you described is like deliberately keep yourself in the game by changing the mm -hmm. speed and so forth. Mm -hmm. Knowing but it does, it does help me. There's no doubt it's helped Don't me. dispute that at all. And uh, I don't know if it's, it's saved my life, uh, but it stopped me from being more scared than I would have been, you know, when, when I went. And the, uh, so, so, so that's the kind of thing. And, and the other part that, um, uh, you know, your next book we'll talk about, uh, is I'm really interested in the, how much we can meet, how much we can meet the machines, mm -hmm. you know, because when you, when you have the, uh, the Amazon, uh, warehouse, and you have the General Motors putting cars together. When you make the robot not look like Rosie the Robot, you know, like a, look as much like Rosie the Robot as a dishwasher looks mm. like Rosie the Robot. Um, and as Godot said, 15 computers, uh, 15 robots that do the work instead of one. I'm really interested to see if we will uh, design houses I mean, if you can right. design a house that Roomba works better in. Well, I mean, China's developing whole cities, right? Mm. They're developing whole cities, for example, around driverless cars where they control pedestrians more so that the driverless cars are safer. Right. There. Or, if you, or if you put all your pedestrians in, in, in separate zones. Or, or, yeah. yeah. Uh, you could do that. So, I mean, I, I think we can do a lot. You, know, you can build a hotel where the robots can actually communicate with the elevators by having Wi-Fi. You can build houses where you know there's Wi-Fi communicating everything with mm -hmm. the Internet of Things. So if you build things from scratch, you make the jobs much easier for the yeah. robots. It becomes the Apple principle instead of the Windows principle. Yeah, I mean, what's really hard is like when you have a whole city in place like New York City and you can't just start over. Um, and you're trying to get the machine into that world. What's interesting to me still about people is for all their flaws, the low bar that it is, um, you can drop people into Manhattan and with all of the problems there and you know the disorganized traffic and so forth, they can do it. So, I mean, I come to this first as a scientist, second as an entrepreneur. So now I'm an entrepreneur, I'm building a robot company and so forth, but I've been interested in the scientists for years and years, like why are children as clever as they are? and why can they learn language when adults can't and why can they learn language when computers can't and so forth? There's a really profound question of like, with all our limited cognitive hardware that only takes 20 watts and it's built from this crazy genome stuff that has errors and repeats and all that kind of stuff, why is it still better than, you know, sort of all the king's horses and all the king's men of all the best people at Google and all the best people at Facebook still don't have machines that have that flexibility? That's what's really interesting to me is the flexibility of human thought to be able to deal with all these different environments. Why haven't we been able to capture that? Even as we have been able to capture chess or arithmetic or um, you know, build video games that have basically real world graphics. Like why is this particular problem so elusive? Yeah, and uh, what's fascinating about it is on the way there, 
uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of meeting and changing, you know, because sure. you, you can rebuild New York City uh, if you build a city uh, from scratch that is more efficient and cheaper and people like more. Tell that the people who put the Second Avenue subway together. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 city might grow. I mean, if you if you built a city somewhere that um, that did have, you know, something problems. we haven't talked about at all is neuroscience. Um, and neuroscience has its own problems right now. So we have a lot of data, but we don't really understand the data in the long run. You're going to solve consciousness in three minutes. <laughs> in the long run, we we will um, be able to directly interface with the brain. We can already do that for like moving things around people's hands. You can, you can build an artificial hand that you can control. It's not perfect, but we have prototypes that show that this is possible. People that have par been paralyzed are going to start more and more being able to use robot arms. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not good stuff yet, but it's proof of concept there. Um, so eventually maybe it's 50 or hundred years, we're going to have a lot of AI systems that are directly wired up to the brain. Nobody really knows what that's going to be like. I'm, my metaphor here is nobody knew when the internet was going to come out that that was going to lead to like social networking, fake news, and like the the ways better juggling, better juggling. It's true. Yeah. N nobody realized all of the consequences. I don't think anybody really understands the consequence of what you're asking about right now, which is when the AI works together more closely with us, when the AI is smart enough in the ways that I describe, that it can actually understand what you're thinking and build on your thoughts rather than just kind of like guessing at them in this vague way. Um, what is that gonna lead to? We really don't know. Yeah, when we do a, when we do a hybrid. Yeah, exactly. So the stuff, the stuff that AI is really good at with the stuff that people are really good at. The thing I don't like about my own book is I wish we could have said more about that. We allude to it at the very end and we we just sort of, we didn't feel like we knew enough. The, the example we gave there is in Blade Runner, you have these super smart androids that are way smarter than we have anything right now. And at one point they stop at a payphone. And there's like no actual world yeah, yeah. in which you can build an Android and not build a cell phone. Right. And we didn't want to be projecting Android yeah. that cell phone. That's yeah. very funny. Yeah, that's the uh, that's that's all over those those kinds of mistakes. And that's that's kind of what um, what Kurzweil leads us down is the fact that we're always wrong about all that stuff. Yeah, he, so, well, he likes to pretend that he's right about it. I know. But a, but, a, but a person comes along and says, we don't know yeah. where it's going to go. He also has this kind of error of fake precision that makes you believe him. He's like, in 2031, and any, <laughs> yeah. any statistician would say, well, you need a confidence interval here. Like it could be 2000. 31 plus or minus five years or maybe plus or minus a century or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We, plus or minus a century. But when you say 2031, like the human mind's like, oh, that sounds accurate and yeah, precise. It's so like it, what it, they what PAs learn on movie sets. Say I'll have it there in 13 minutes instead of saying 10 or 15. That's and what people Kurzweil somehow does. believe you. Yeah, that's what Kurzweil does, but you shouldn't, right? No, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Never, ever. It means 35 if when you're they lucky, say 13. If you're lucky, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to let you go because we're just about done. But blast. this is this is fabulous. Blast. This was just fabulous. Thank and, you. And uh, that was Penn Sunday School. <laughs> See that? See that? AI would have gotten that right on. Boom. I wouldn't have understood the words, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> we recognized it. Cha cha cha. You become naked. I missed it. <laughs> oh, we should say again. Let's say this again. I want to make sure I get it right here. Um, rebooting AI, building artificial intelligence we can trust. Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. Read it. I don't know if I said this before. Rebooting AI, building artificial intelligence we can trust by Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. Is a Roomba smarter than a bug? <laughs> is a Roomba smarter than a bug? A Roomba is actually modeled on a bug in some way, but no, it's not as smart as a bug. Mm. Okay. Bugs got it all going on, man. Bugs don't, bugs don't change, though. Bugs don't change, though. Don't solve problems. They, they don't you know, do a lot thinking. of learning, but honeybees actually learn a lot. There's good documentation on it. Um, I mean, you can, you can teach honeybees something in the lab. Um, like, you can teach them that to do this thing, you need to match the last thing that you saw, and 
they'll pick that up. Who you teach them uh, to drive a car too? Um, plus, honeybees do this amazing thing of calculating where they are based on the light. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the azimuth function, and they can do that for patterns of light they've never seen. They, they have a really cool function built in there. What we're going to end up doing is it. taking. Yeah, take, we're going to go another hour. <laughs> we're going to take AI, and we're going to end up doing this really uh, uh, morally horrible thing. We're going to end up taking mouse brains and putting them into the AI and uh, using that to do the pattern learning. Like I, uh, yeah, we, I don't have AI, but my car is driven by a bunch of bees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>